Please turn in your Bibles to chapter 8 of John. John chapter 8. The Gospel of John chapter 8. We're going to begin reading with verse 31. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants, and have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Amen. We all know that on September the 11th, 2001, a day that lives in our memories, and I can still picture all those scenes, those pictures that we saw on the television screen, our freedom came under attack, visibly. We saw it. We know it. It wasn't just something behind the scenes. It was out in the open for the whole world to see. Our national and our civil freedom, that is. That's what we're talking about there, as we know. But our real freedom, freedom in Christ, is also continually under attack by the enemy of our souls, Satan. So we not only have to be on guard against the terrorists, a foreign enemy that would come and, and attack us, try to destroy our economy and our way of life and take away our freedoms and take away the things that are so precious to us and kill thousands and maybe even hundreds of thousands of Americans. And don't ever forget that they are still trying to do that whenever the opportunity arises and they think they can pull off the big one, they're going to try to do it. But there's also one who's undermining everything that we try to do as Christians. Satan, the enemy of our soul. He is more to be feared than an enemy, a human enemy that we can see. We can fight against them. <clears throat> We can, we can, uh, they can be shot, they can be bombed, they can be, they can be imprisoned. Satan is our enemy who is going about like a roaring lion, the Bible says, seeking whom he may devour. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 and following talks about how we have to be concerned about him because he's the prince and the power of the air and, and all of these things are going on that are invisible in our world, but we can see the results of this sinful, evil empire of Satan that's going on. So this morning, we will be talking, taking time to talk about both of these kinds of freedoms because they're linked. Somebody might question why we should have the presentation of the colors and the singing of the national anthem in a, in a public service. But our nation, whether many people, there, and I know there are many in our people who do not want to acknowledge this, but our nation was founded on Christian principles for liberty so that they could worship freely. It was not to keep the church out of the business of politics, it was to keep the state, the government, out of the business of the church. That was what it was all about to begin with. And a lot of things have been turned around in our day, and we hear all this about separation of church and state, which is really not even a phrase that can be found in the Constitution and it's used in an incorrect way by many who want to take away 
the freedoms that we have. And so, you know, you, sometimes we talk about the fact that children can no longer pray in school. Well, is that really true? Even if they can't hear a prayer by a teacher or can't say a prayer publicly, no one can stop them from praying. Prayer is between you and God. You don't have to say words aloud in order to pray to God, do you? God knows the desires of your heart. So nobody can stop prayer and nobody can take can ultimately take that freedom away from you. And I suppose even though we hate to even think of losing the freedoms that we enjoy, maybe we've taken them so much for granted that when they come under attack, we may begin to appreciate them more and take a new view of, of things. But the scripture that we have read this morning talks about the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. The first thing that I want us to notice here in this scripture, and I emphasized it as I read it, Jesus said the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. Many people don't really want the truth. They only want the part of the truth that agrees with what they think. You ever, ever found that out? Uh, I was reading things about the, the laws of our land about abortion and, the, and all the things the legislators, legislature has gone through about this. And, and you know about partial birth abortion because we've heard all about, about the things about that. And always what is brought up is that this is done to, for the health and the safety of the mother. And medical groups have come out and said that they can think of no case where an abortion would be the only means of helping the mother in those cases where a partial birth abortion is used. And yet, some of the people in, our, in policy making places they didn't like that. They didn't like that truth that came from a medical group. And so they changed it. They changed this, what was said, what was stated about it. Because they didn't like the truth. Because the truth did not agree with what they wanted to do. They didn't want any restrictions whatsoever on abortion. Not even on the gruesome procedure of partial birth abortion. And I know you've heard enough about that, but you don't need me to go into that and describe anything about that to you this morning. Surely you've heard what that involves. And so sometimes, even highly educated people don't really want the whole truth to come out because it doesn't agree with the things they want to do. Jesus said, the truth will set you free. There are some people that, are, that when they read the Bible or when they discuss theological issues with some people, they're afraid that they might be proven wrong. They don't like to discuss things because they're afraid they might find something that doesn't agree with what they already think. How many of us go to the Bible with our minds already made up and, and go there to find, to prove what we already believe? Many people do that. Why do we have hundreds of different denominations in, our, in Protestantism? I had a book about that thick on denominations. I believe there were 33 different kinds of Baptists. There were American Baptists, Northern Baptists, Southern Baptists, Free Will Baptists, Primitive Baptists, Hardshell Baptists, about the same as pri Primitive Baptists. They're sometimes they're interchangeable. Um, they're all they're, they're, that's only a few of them. And then there are, there are different kinds of Methodists, and they're all different groups and splinter groups of all these. And there were 360 or 70 different denominations mostly of, of Christ, they were of Christianity. How can people all take the same book and come up with so many different ideas? That's confusing to, to non-believers sometimes.